Well, hello and welcome to the Autosport Podcast. I'm your host, Alex Callan Orcus. Today I'm joined by Jess McFadden, Luke Smith and Jonathan Noble and today we're here to preview again the 2020 Formula 1 season which is finally about to get underway with the Austrian Grand Prix this weekend. Now things will of course be very different because of the coronavirus pandemic so unfortunately Luke and I will be reporting on the opening races from home using all sorts of supporting material to make sure we're bringing you all of our usual in-depth coverage, analysis, the race reports etc uh, that has been made available to all full-time Formula 1 journalists but John you will be in Austria. Well, we hope because you've had at least one flight cancelled and it's been a bit of a palaver, quite painful. Uh, but you are hopefully going to be on the ground. You've been coronavirus tested, negative, which is excellent. How has it all been going? And is this the weirdest build up in terms of travel logistics to a race you've ever had? Yeah, so, I mean, Australia was all, everything was all booked before we went to Australia. Um, and obviously you were checking the news and seeing what's happening. But logistic wise, it was quite easy. Whereas this is a lot of hoops to get through. So Sunday, Sunday morning, what should I do in the day? The original day of the French Grand Prix, I was up at Silverstone having the uh, coronavirus test that you need 72 hours before you arrive in Austria, 96 hours before you get into the, um, they'll let you into the paddock, into the track. Um, so swab down the throat, swab up each nostril. That was done twice. So uh, not the most pleasant of experiences. Um, negative test result came back yesterday. All looks fine. And then today's been a day of, for myself and a few other journalists, flight cancellations. Uh, and now trying to work out alternative ways of getting there. Obviously, there's not as many flights going, a lot more restrictions, uh, a lot more, a lot fewer um, options for getting to places. So fingers crossed I'm going tomorrow, but let's wait and see what tomorrow brings. Well, absolutely. But let's let's hope for the best. It'll be really good to have you on the ground. It's going to be it's going to be an interesting way to cover a Grand Prix for all of us. I mean, I mean, to be honest, I've I've never covered a Grand Prix before because the pandemic delightfully <laughs> happened just as I was about to make my debut in Melbourne on the far side of the world, having gone all that way. Not that I'm bitter about it or anything, you know, and uh, obviously far more, far more terrible and serious things have happened in the meantime. But John, let's just let's just go back to you again. Um, what are we expecting to be different about this Austrian Grand Prix in terms of all the coronavirus protocols? What's going to look different in terms of what people will see when they tune in on on Friday, Saturday, Sunday? I think once the TV cameras are focused on the track, there won't be a, you won't notice a difference. The cars will be going around as they normally are. The, the intensity of the competition, what the the teams are going through in terms of you know testing tires and understanding setup will all be the same. But when you shift into the pit lane and when you shift into the paddock. Things will be very different. Um, everyone will be wearing face masks. Uh, in the paddock, there'll be no motorhomes. Instead, the trucks are going to be moved further back into the paddock. There'll be tents. There'll be awnings behind the garage to try and give people space. Everyone's going to be more spaced out for social distancing. Uh, so I think it's going to be a very different vibe down in the paddock. And because there's need for social bubbles, so um, the teams can't mix with each other, and there's social bubbles within teams, so the, the crew on, say, Lewis Hamilton's car, won't mix with the crew on Valtteri Bottas's car. They're trying to keep people as far apart as possible to minimise the the risk of an infection spreading through a team or spreading through the paddock. Um, I think it's going to be quite a, a weird vibe for what you what you can and can and can't do. Um, even from the media ourselves, we aren't allowed in the paddock. We aren't allowed in the pit lane. Um, there'll be some organised press conferences where the, the drivers or team representatives will be brought up to the media centre. Um, it'll be interesting to see if that's behind perfect screens and we've got to keep face masks on all this uh, two meters of social distancing. Um, but the days of, uh, you know, press scrums and us all crowded around, cameras in our faces and trying to dig our bolodictophones in close to drivers, they're gone for now. Yeah, it seems almost remarkable to think that over 100 days ago, we were all in Melbourne and that scrum around Chase Carey and the, and, and um, Michael Massey from the FIA and, and the Australian Grand Prix Corporation officials, there were hundreds of people gathered around there with all the TV crews, which just you just think now that the world has, has adapted and shifted and moved on, that just wouldn't be allowed at all. But Jess, coming to you, I mean, at least finally now we can say Formula One is back. How much are you looking forward to this weekend getting underway? I mean, yeah, it's just someone was saying to me it's been seven months since we've, you know, since we've had the season and, and I can't believe it's been seven months. It's it's almost been it, it feels like I can't believe this weekend's actually happening. And there's still a little part of me that's really hoping beyond all hope that nothing's going to come in to, to mess it up. But it's been 
such a long time now um, and I mean that's almost going to give this season a bit of a well I hope a bit of an excitement a bit of a boost because these cars haven't been out on track since uh, since testing and while some people might have had you know various teams have had their media days where they've been able to use the 2020 car for filming they've not really had that much of a of a um, of a stretch out to get their to get that feeling back in the car and as we've seen with the likes of, of Ferrari they've come out and said you know we don't have any updates because the car wasn't performing like we thought it was going to and now we're going to get to see that actually play out in racing which yeah I'm just I'm massively massively looking forward to it. Absolutely. Well, Jess has raised an interesting point there that I'm going to throw to you, Luke, is that Red Bull are the only one of the top three teams that have been able to properly, well, kind of properly, use their 2020 uh, design because they've done a filming day at Silverstone. Now, with the rules uh, of using the current cars, because, of course, outside the normal testing restrictions, you can't really use them. They're only limited to 100 kilometres on demonstration tyres, whereas uh, Mercedes and Ferrari had to conduct their pre-Austria preparations, just sort of, you know, shaking the rust off after the lockdowns, really. They had to do that with 2018 cars now that meant that they they were sort of a little bit more freer in what they could do but obviously it's a it's a different car it's one from two years ago that's the the rules are there and in, in place that no one gains an advantage but would red bull have got a slight advantage by being able to get a li little bit more familiar with their rv16 oh uh, well i think all running with the current car i think that's always good like obviously you would rather have it than not have it but i think that I think what I'm personally really interested to see is just how all the teams adjust to these new protocols and ultimately get used to running with the sort of trimmed down team numbers and things such as that. And um, I know uh, Mercedes, for example, although they were uh, obviously had to use the 2018 car, they went through every single element of that Grand Prix weekend um, using these new protocols, working with uh, trimmed down uh, staff numbers. And even even to the point of like putting the car on the grid and doing like a proper grid start and everything like that. And they really, I think, sort of thought, well, let's use the fact that we're not as limited on uh, our test running and things like that to go through those sort of protocols. And I think that, yeah, while it's all good that Red Bull would have used the 2020 car, the fact that it was only 100 kilometers they're limited to means that it's a, I don't know, you're not going to get a huge amount out of that, I think, compared to um, what you would with a, a full day of testing in terms of learning these protocols. Um, I think all teams have raced that the Friday in uh, Austria is going to be a really, really busy one. Like data gathering is going to be so, so important because they ultimately they've not had running in so long. A lot of the teams got big update packages coming. Uh, Renault have promised a triple update package, uh, what would have been on the car for uh, the races in Vietnam, Holland and in Spain. And I think things such as that, I think that's where I think Friday in Austria, like it's going to be probably the most important practice sessions that we've seen in F1 for a long, long time because they're not only shaking off the dust and uh, I guess getting into sort of the routine of a new Grand Prix weekend, but they've got in some cases such heavily different cars to what they had uh, when we last saw them running in, uh, in pre-season testing. Absolutely. I hope our uh, technical editor, Jake Boxall Leg, realises what hell he's in for on Friday because every car, pretty much, perhaps not the Ferrari, well, definitely not the Ferrari, as Jesse said earlier, but a lot of updates are going to be there and it's going to be interesting just to see. I spoke to Christian Horn the other day for an interview that's in uh, the Autosport magazine, which is returning to your shelves, to your doors, hopefully, with your, your subscribers this Thursday. Do check that out uh, for a feature in, in the magazine. And it was interesting, first of all, because like, he did get in one particularly uh, good dig, I thought. Well, not really a dig, but a, a psychological marker laid down where he said that Red Bull have already immediately on that filming day done a sub two second pit stop despite the lockdown which I thought was quite good of him there um but also just just the fact that yeah they they have they have rolled on all their updates that they would would have introduced in the in the early part of the season so John maybe coming back to you are we then therefore I mean Ferrari have already said in, in testing we're behind Red Bull and Mercedes well they they almost certainly are now if they're not gonna if they're not gonna update their car until Hungary but maybe that's when Ferrari might be joining the battle a little bit more if they're gonna perhaps completely rework the the, the fundamental bits of their car yeah I think we've got a we'll have a disconnect between what we saw in testing and uh what we see at now this first race because normally there's very little time between the final day of testing and the first race in Melbourne. You know, a few teams bring a few updates, but normally the final day of testing in Barcelona is the package for Australia. But now you've got months and months of development. So I think you, it's impossible to predict where the Red Bull and where the Mercedes battle, uh, you know, will turn out because the, the car updates could, could make the world a difference. And, you know, it was significant that Red Bull last week, you know, 100 kilometres, but the eagle-eyed observers spotted a lot of changes on that car, especially in the floor area. Um, the side pod areas, there's some big air updates with the new Honda engine coming as well there, Spec 2. 
there is going to be a step forward there. But, you know, this news from Ferrari that they're going down a different aero route, they're doing some major revamp, I meaning they're going to have, in effect, their Barcelona car. It means I don't think we can expect them to be fighting at the front in Austria. So I think we've got a straight Red Bull v Mercedes battle. And it's going to be it's going to be an interesting one, isn't it, Luke? Because Mercedes, we they released a video of James Allison saying basically, effectively, that what they had in testing was effectively a frozen bit of development from almost Christmas, and then what you would have seen added onto the car in in Australia in the early part of the year, obviously hasn't been able to, but it will be coming for Austria. So it's that effectively, they're going to be unleashing about three months worth of work onto the onto the W11. So fair to say that they'll be making a, a bigger step, a better, well, a significant step as well. Yeah, you definitely expect it. I think um, it's really exciting that although Ferrari are on the back foot and as John said, obviously they're not going to bring anything until Hungary, that both Red Bull and Mercedes have come out of the blocks very early on and said, look, we've got we've got these updates, we've not stopped working, even with everything going on in the world, we've still got our heads down and really sort of focused on this development work. And uh, yeah, for the, both of them to come out and say that, look, we're going to be even even quicker, hopefully in uh, in Austria than we would have been starting the season. I think that that's really good. Like it's really exciting. I think we we know that with the uh, obviously the car freeze for 2021 is that we're going to get on to later it's kind of going to be a bit of a funny period for F1 development and uh, I know there's certain freeze points through the year uh, with the token system that's coming in limiting how much teams can uh, develop their cars so I think for both of them to come out of the blocks really early on and say look we, we've got these update packages coming that that's really promising. Like I think it's good. I think we do want to keep, sort of keep this uh, level of uh, level of gamesmanship and uh, this sort of arms race, I guess, between between at least two parties. And uh, yeah, hopefully Ferrari once they get their act together for Hungary, hopefully they can uh, join that fight at the front as well because uh, it's uh, it's going to be a funny old season. It's unprecedented. That uncertainty can really, I think, lead to quite an exciting season. I think it's uh, if we throw in maybe a few sort of freak results here and there as well, maybe have some inclement weather as looks possible in Austria this weekend. I think it could be, yeah, really, really fascinating and really shake things up. And Absolutely. It'd be almost typical, wouldn't it, if we get all this build up and expecting, oh, we, we need a normal race to see where everybody actually does sit and then it rains, which is, of course, fantastic and we see some amazing action. But yeah, that would just, that would just, that would just be fairly typical. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting. Jess, you mentioned the, the last couple of years, the, the Red Bull ring, Max Verstappen has come away victorious and Mercedes has seemed to struggle. And I was sort of thinking about that and I was thinking, well, maybe, you know, if we, if we want to have a really, a really interesting uh, title battle right from the off Red Bull has got to hit the ground running straight away but what's perhaps more interesting is the fact that it actually Mercedes have been quick the last couple of years of the Red Bull ring it's just been reliability that's let them down but again that ties back into this season John maybe you could maybe you could um, explain what happened in testing with the with the with the Mercedes reliability it was the it was it was the the champion squad that suddenly didn't appear to be all that bulletproof and we saw it man- manifest itself quite massively at Williams as well the customer team yeah, I think, the, I think the problems in testing, um, from what I recall, were, were a batch problem, um, which they'd gone through and worked out and in the end felt there wasn't, wouldn't be a compromise for the Australian Grand Prix. But one of the lessons that Mercedes took out last year of Austria and the other high-altitude race in Mexico was that their engine wasn't perhaps, power unit perhaps wasn't best optimised um, for high altitude. Um, the turbo um, operates in a, in a different um, environment um, much favoured, much favoured, much more the Honda engine, and we saw Max Verstappen doing, you know, so well last in Austria, winning the race. Should have been on pole in Mexico, but had the the yellow flag infringement. Um, and the Mercedes, you know, weren't at their best on both of those. But I think the Mercedes talked about learning the lessons from there, uh, revamping the design a little bit, trying to work out where the weaknesses were to improve. So I think this will be a good test bed um, this weekend and the weekend after. How much progress Mercedes have made. Uh, at the altitude tracks so let's let's look back uh, you know at the build up to australia and what we were expecting to be a pretty a pretty feisty uh, atmosphere in the paddock anyway even without what was going on with the, with the unfolding pandemic because there were various things going on there was mercedes and its dash steering system red bull weren't particularly happy about that racing point managed to upset the all of all of the midfield it seemed with their with their uh, uh, their use of the well that their, their mercedes inspired design and of course ferrari had basically upset everybody with the engine settlement they conducted with the fia over their 2019 power unit so what are you expecting to be the first one to cause trouble in austria i'll throw that out you at you if you don't mind <laughs> 
Well, I think I, I mean I think it's going to be really interesting to see that DAS system in operation um, because that's definitely that was the biggest talking point, uh, regardless of the uh, kind of FIA and Ferrari dramas and uh, and a and a copycat looking uh, racing point. But I think that's going to be the one that's going to provide potentially the most impact to, to the to the racing, which is what I think everybody's going to be focusing on once we get up and running again. Um, kind of uh, back chat aside in terms of the other the other areas, it's going to be this one that, that's obviously now since been outlawed for the next season, but we will be seeing it in operation. And it's going to be interesting to see if it even gives an advantage or if it was just a bit of uh, smoke and mirrors to, to anything else that was going on on that Mercedes. So it will be it will be an interesting one. I think that's that's the one that's going to be causing the most discussion points because it was such a big discussion point and now we've gone away and no one's actually been able to see it in action properly. Um, so yeah, I think that that's the one that we're going to be focusing on. Yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of attention paid to the onboards of Lewis Hamilton and Valtteri Bottas' cars in those Friday practice sessions to see exactly how the system is being used or you know how they've adapted it or whatever. Um, so Luke, yeah, are you expecting any, any protests potentially over Mercedes and over racing points? Uh, I think... It's going to be fascinating to see. I think there's there's always sort of been this uh, suggestion of oh well we might protest or we, we could sort of lodge something. And I think it the fact that we won't know until probably after the race like what what exactly is going on and whether these protests are going to be lodged and how they'll be upheld and how the stewards will handle it. And the fact that we've only obviously got such quick turnaround with uh, races on the following two weekends as well. And uh, I know the FIA have said that they'll have uh, the stewards uh, be able to uh, work remotely as well uh, so that you'll have people sort of working on Zoom to, to discuss matters and things such as that. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be another really interesting, I think, exercise in sort of how F1 does handle this, this new normal. Um, yeah, and I think with Mercedes, I think the big thing will be whether they do actually run DAS, whether they decide that it's not worth it, not worth having a possible protest against it. Um, uh under under the part for grounds i believe is what uh, any protest would be would be put under uh with the racing point i mean they've always been very like confident that ultimately they're not in any breach that ultimately it's there's nothing in the rules saying that they can't um can't follow the design lead of another car because ultimately they've not taken any sort of ip or anything from mercedes uh they've taken a few parts but that's all under listed parts that's all perfectly fair um so yeah i would i'd be i'd be surprised if there was a protest against racing point i think that they've that they appear to have done everything by the book with mercedes i think that's going to come purely down to whether they or not they want to run the risk of running das if they do i think it'll be as jess said fascinating to see just how effective it actually is um, and then, yeah, what the reaction is from, from the opposition camps. And uh, I just spoke about the age of consensus in F1, but in a few days' time, that could all come shattering shattering apart. It'd be quite fascinating to see. Now, I'm going to put all three of you on the spot. We're going to do a bit of a bit of predictions, a bit of speculation, which, of course, will be utterly wrong. And I'll tell you why it's definitely going to be wrong. It's because I'm going to go first, because it's not fair for me to just ask a question of you guys. Um, um, all of my predictions always end up being wrong. So yeah, it's just just a bit of fun. And of course, we have no bias. We have no agenda. We just want to see some good racing. And finally, after so long having it back, it's going to be absolutely wonderful. So my prediction this weekend, and it's not going to be a big surprise considering he's won there the last two years. I'm going to go Max Verstappen and Red Bull win the opening race, especially if it rains because of what we saw in Germany last year. So well, I'm going to go clockwise from my screen, which means, John, you're up next. Who do you think is going to win this weekend? Am I allowed to agree with you? Uh, well, I mean, it says worry. It's a bit worrying about your judgment that you're agreeing with me, but you're certainly allowed to put Max Verstappen <laughs> forward as a, as a potential. Yeah, race I just, just think that the nature, the nature of the circuit, the fact Honda's got an upgrade, um, you know, the, the level of confidence Red Bull is showing. Uh, I just think that for that track in particular, I think it'll be a be a Red Bull weekend, which therefore expect Max to Max to do it. But longer term, uh, I think it'd be a different answer if you could ask me about the championship but you didn't ask that so that's fine oh, maybe I should have done damn no we'll stick we'll just we'll stick to we'll stick to race predictions because that they're silly enough by themselves well next up on the way I'm looking at the screen is Luke who do you think is going to win this weekend uh so I'm gonna go for another man who's done very well in Austria over the years I'm gonna say that Valtteri Bottas is gonna win uh, this weekend's season opener um I think he's he's been pretty vocal about his training recently and like he sounds he sounds really fired up I don't know and I know all drivers are sort of like oh yeah I've been working out a lot and like really trying to use this break for the best but there's just something a little bit different about the way Bottas was speaking like another sort of 
added steel, really. So, uh, yeah, I think back to, I believe it was the 2017 race that he absolutely dominated there. I think that may see something uh, a little bit similar to that, potentially. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to say a Bottas win to start the season. Okay, so he's going to come on his radio and he's going to say, uh, to whom it may concern, Luke Smith at Autosport. Thank you <laughs> yeah. for your prediction. I'm sure I'm sure yes. he definitely to whom did it that may concern, comes true you. on Sunday. <laughs> Uh, finally, Jess, coming to you, who do you think is going to win on Sunday in Austria? Uh, I don't want to be boring, but I think I'm going to have to agree with, with you and John. Um, it just seems to be, at least over the past couple of years, it's just been Verstappen's track. Um, so I think unless for some reason there's there's something that, well, I think, as John said, if, if, if we get something quite crazy like rain, then I think even more so it's going to play into their hands. So, And interestingly enough, we're not putting Albon up there, but I think that's probably a little bit unfair to have, uh, to, to kind of say that he, he could take it to Max, but who knows? Uh, but yeah, I think I'm going to have to go for Max Verstappen, although a, a Bottas 3.0 season opener again like we had last year, that's going to set, going to set the media and Twitter alight, isn't it, really? Definitely, definitely. Well, understandably, no one said a Ferrari driver, considering what we know about the team in testing and what they've said recently. Nobody said Lewis Hamilton, though, so perhaps he'll uh, he'll be out to prove the Autosport podcast wrong. Um, well, I'm sure, he, I'm sure he won't be, but there we go. Thank you guys very much for joining us. Thank you, everybody, to listening or for watching along. Thank you to our producer, Martin, for putting this all together. John, we hope you make it to Austria and uh, we'll see how this weekend goes we're really excited we're really looking forward to racing being back we're going to bring you some amazing coverage on autosport.com on motorsport.com all of our race reports and analysis all my driver ratings which I'm particularly nervous about it's going to upset a lot of people on the internet no doubt uh, all of that will be coming over the coming weeks do subscribe to autosport.com plus uh, motorsport.com prime and we're bringing you all of our best journalism all our features all our new stories and race reports we're really looking forward to formula one being back to the wider motorsport community all coming back in the coming weeks as well and yeah thank you very much again for listening and watching and we'll see you again soon goodbye <laughs>